Hey everyone, it's Amanda Bruton with Medicare Answers Now, and um, I am re-recording today's webinar this afternoon. Um, we had so many people that were on it that we ended up crashing the system multiple times as we had 50 plus people at a pop just joining in. So um, I am going to go ahead and post this on social media. We are having another live training on um, June 20th at three o'clock Eastern time. Um, you can find that on my website. You can find it all over social media that the link is there uh, to go ahead and um, register for that event. Um, it is free and it is open to everybody. So tell your colleagues by all means, they are welcome to go ahead and join it. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen so that that way you can see it. Um, and we're going to go ahead and start this presentation. A couple of things that I do want to um, just housekeeping things that I want you guys aware of. Um, for those of you that have never heard me teach before or you're coming back and watching for taking notes, um, first, grab a piece of paper and a pencil, listen carefully, stop and pause as you watch this to take your notes. Um, I will be updating these slides, turning them into a PDF that you can then use if you want um, for other events and things that you do. Uh, so stay tuned for that. It will not be ready for a little bit yet, um, but I will make it available to those that attend one of my in-person webinars. Um, I am not manually emailing these out uh, to people. So today we're going to go ahead and talk about the 2025 Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it is law. Uh, so these changes that we're talking about today um, you can speak to before October uh, 1st, and you actually should. Um, the reason why I chose to do this webinar um, and get this out into the aging community is so that that way you guys got the information well ahead of time because um, CMS is not planning to have their outreach start until October, and it's way too late to affect this many people. Um, so let me go into the start of this. Um, for those of you who do not know who I am, as I mentioned, my name is Amanda Bruton and I own, uh, Medicare Answers Now. I've been in the business for about 17 plus years now. Um, my thing is educating agents. Um, I have been doing it for years. I host multiple conferences, um, or partner in them, uh, as you'll see. And um, the three of them are on the screen um, for you to be aware of. Um, the first one is my pride and joy, which is Ms. Medicare. Uh, this one is in its fourth year this year. Um, it is in Cleveland, Ohio, and it is specifically for women um, to show them other women role models in the industry and for us to collaborate and learn from each other about what we do and how we're successful at it. The next one that I have and the first one for next year is going to be Medicarians. Um, I will be the partner for the Agent Symposium, which is their free day that um, you can attend at Medicarians, which is in Las Vegas. Next year, it will be around my birthday, actually. So it'll be April 31st, or sorry, March 31st, March 31st to April 2nd. And then my birthday is actually the third. So um, this is more of a trade show-esque type of event. Um, you're going to get in the weeds with learning actually how the Medicare sector works. Um, and the who's who's there. So you have policy people, you have actuarial from the carriers, you have different vendors regarding the different technology that's there. Um, it's just this huge event um, with a ridiculous amount of learning that's there. Um, tickets for agents are free. You can go to medicarians.com and then click um, the hosted ticket enter in the code Amanda, uh, my first name, and then um, you'll be able to get your reserve ticket for Medicarians. Hope to see you there. It is totally worth it. And yes, the content is very different than my other two conferences are. 
Last but not least uh, is my vacation themed event uh, conference. And this one is in April at the end. So April 28th through the 30th, it's held in Orange Beach, Alabama. And this one is unlike any other event that uh, I've seen out on the market. Uh, it's in its third year and it is six two hour deep dives about various different uh, topics. So back office support marketing, we actually spend a whole day on. Um, we talk about staffing and goal setting and cross selling. And it's a really good way for you to technically go to school from eight in the morning until noon. And then we break in the afternoon and then we come back in the evening for a lot of networking and good times. So it's super cool, a lot of fun. Um, and uh, hope if you wanna know anything more about these events, check out my website or um, any of the websites that you see that are on this particular slide. Um, so to go into who my company is, uh, as I mentioned, I own Medicare Answers Now, which is an FMO based out of Cleveland, Ohio. I've been in the business for 17 years teaching agents. I worked on the carrier side before going out on my own about five years ago. Um, we are in 39 states and um, I have all the bells and whistles and tools and things that every other FMO uh, has. We are not affiliated with Integrity or uh, AmeriLife. Um, we are, I'm, I'm my own. Um, I roll up into TLC Insurance Group uh, as my NMA um, or top line. Um, and what makes us different than every other FMO is the uh, education and coaching that we do. It's what I specialize in. Um, and, you know, every agent that works with us, we I do one-on-ones with to help them figure out what they want to be when they grow up and how to get to those goals and dreams that they have. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of what we do and um, how we do it. So this particular slide shows you my office. It also gives you um, my contact information. By all means, feel free to reach out at any point in time or call the office. Um, I highly recommend that you check out our website and definitely uh, follow us on, follow me on social media. Um, I am on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I run a couple of Facebook groups, which you'll find out later in this particular training. But these are all things that you definitely want to um, take a look at. So this is the other part of my team. They are the people that uh, drive this bus. Uh, I would not be nearly as successful as I am without their support. Um, and this is really only half of the team that we have. Um, the boys actually all are remote. Um, so that that's why they're not on. And this would get way too big of a matrix if I had everybody. Um, but many of you have seen or met firsthand many of the ladies that are on here, uh, especially if you've attended any of the um, conferences that you just saw on the screen before. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. So um, we have a lot. Um, this is not a beginner level class. Uh, we are going to go into the weeds um, on this. I'm going to talk about the legalese side of this when it comes to the regulations. I'm going to explain how this impacts you and your clients and your communities and really what you need to understand as the opportunity that is here for you um, in that it is the largest opportunity in the Medicare space since 2006. Let me say that again. The opportunity going into this AEP is the largest opportunity that you have had since 2006. Every single Medicare beneficiary will be affected by the changes that are we are going to discuss today. In addition to that, um, I don't know whether or not you guys are aware of the new stat, but it is no longer the old 10,000 people are turning 65 every day. I, I, you know, I've heard that stats quoted for the last 17 years. The updated statistic is 12,000 people turn 65 every day, 12,000 of them. And that's going to continue to be that way 
for at least another four plus years. So when you look at the, uh, the opportunity and the entirety of this, the agent that is deliberate with their time management, with the systems that they're using and how they're looking at growing and getting out into their individual communities and reaching out to their referral partners, those are the people that are going to have a leg up and hit the um, targets that they have set for themselves and their own goals, okay? So um, like I said, I hope you have a piece of paper and a pen. We're going to start going into the weeds on this stuff um, and let's go. So the first thing, as I mentioned before, um, since some of you can't listen to save your soul, I'm going to repeat myself a couple of times on some of these key points just to make sure that I you have heard me. But the information that I am discussing today is information that is in the law. It is not up for discussion. It is not a, ooh, if they change their mind. If this is, it is going to happen. It is set in stone. These things must be rolled out in this upcoming AEP, come hell or high water, it is happening, okay? So now it is time for you to embrace the changes and the things that are going on and for you to understand them. Some of this information will be in the AHIP that comes out at the end of this month. I highly recommend for every single one of you to make sure that you take the AHIP in its entirety, um, I did this this afternoon and candidly was horrified at the amount of agents that don't know what a deductible is and that don't have some of the very basic concepts down about how these plans work. So I beg you, please take the entire AHIP, go in it for understanding, not just to zip through and get it knocked out. You really need to learn what this is. Um, and that's the end of my lecture, right? So again, these changes are going to take effect come January 1 of 2025. That means that we will start talking about them and you will see the plan changes and how they are affected as of October 1st. Um, there are changes to the uh, true out-of-pocket or troop. There's also changes in the entire um, way that the basic standard CMS um, Part D structure looks like. So the different phases are changing and we are completely eliminating the gap, the coverage gap on this. So we do have some significant changes that are coming when we are looking at the uh, this upcoming year. So um, if we look at the current baseline of a standard Part D plan. Now, when I say standard Part D plan, what I am referring to is that it is the baseline. It can be either on a standalone Part D or it can be integrated into an MAPD plan or a Medicare Advantage plan, right? So if I'm talking about this, understand that I'm looking at it from both respects. When it comes to the offerings on the standalone drug plans, right now, most insurance carriers offer three plans on the standalone. You have the basic one, which is the CMS dictated structure. You have a basic one, which is the middle of the road, if you will. It's not the one that's the zero or the five or $10 one. This one is usually about 35 bucks. And then you have the enhanced alternative drug plan, which is the one that's really, really expensive. Well, what you're going to see with the changes that are happening is we expect that the drug plans are going to shift. So they won't offer three plans. They may offer only two or they may pull entirely out of the market like Mutual of Omaha is planning on doing, um, which those intents had to be filed today to CMS. So stay tuned when you see your early looks or your first looks that are coming out. 
Um, though, you know, we should start hearing rumblings of these changes in the upcoming weeks. And you want to use those as a baseline. They are not set in stone. So when we go ahead and we look at the definition of an enhanced alternative benefit design, it is changing a little bit. And basically what that is, is, is like I said, you have the standard st structure, which is what CMS says, which we'll talk about in a minute in the next slide. And then you have what's referred to as the enhanced. And what makes it an enhanced alternative is that it is going to have either a reduction or an elimination of the deductible, or it's going to have a reduction in the coinsurance or co-pays in the initial coverage phase. So that is primarily what denotes something as being enhanced versus standard when it comes to the drug design on the drug card, whether it be on the standalone or on the one that is integrated on the MAPD, right? So when we look at the phases, and you're going to see this as something that you can read on this slide, and then I have a graphic that you may want to take a picture of in a minute. Um, but one of the things that you need to see on this is, is that the drug deductible for 2025 is going to be $590. And this is 100% the insured's responsibility to pay on the standard drug plan. So the drug phase is the 590. And then you go after that is met, then you go into the initial coverage phase, right? So this one, they're shifting it. So the insured is going to pay up to 25% co-insurance co -insurance for all covered prescriptions. Now, that is going to go up to a new out-of-pocket threshold, which is now at $2,000. Let me repeat that again. The annual out-of-pocket is dropping to $2,000. So the other thing that you want to note is that there is now going to be a new payment plan option that will be offered by the carriers. So those are key changes that we've got that are, that are happening. And then once that $2,000 is met, you have it where they fall into catastrophic phase. And at this point, the carrier, the manufacturer, and the government are going to cover all of the remaining prescription drug costs. So after the $2,000, the insured has no more money that they are going to fork over, right? So let's put this into something that's a pretty little graphic so that that way you guys can visually see it. And here's where we've got it, right? Take out your phones, take a picture of it if you want. But again, you can talk about this. You can educate to it that these are the upcoming changes that are happening. But again, your deductible is stage is, for the standard plan is that the beneficiary is responsible for 100% of the drug costs. Then you have it where the initial stage is up to 25% coinsurance of meds that are on the formulary. And that includes the deductible. We're going to see what all of this includes in a minute because I'm going to define what the out-of-pocket is. And then, as I said, the catastrophic phase, you don't pay any more money. It's now covered. Your meds are now covered at 100%. And this resets every January, like we know traditionally happens on Advantage and on Part D plans, right? So when we go into the next thing that changes, the TROOP, it stands for True Out-of-Pocket Cost. And yes, I am going to read this particular slide because I need to to drive it home. This is going to include the annual deductible, the cost sharing above the deductible, up to the initial coverage limit. It can also include the drug manufacturer's discount for brand name drugs. 
Um, drugs that count towards the troop must be on the formulary. And if it's a formulary exception, then it is meant that it will be covered on the formulary. That's what the definition of a formulary exception is. It's taking a med that is not on the formulary, making an exception and putting it on the formulary. Usually when that happens, they fall in a tier four or tier five because of the exception that is made, but it's going to depend on the carrier of the product and the year as to how that is done. If you're not familiar with it, again, refer to section three of the AHIP. Now, flipping back into this, you got to have the drug cost. The drug must be on the formulary and it must be purchased at a participating network pharmacy. The other things that count towards troop are going to be the state pharmaceutical assistance programs, charities, HSAs, FSAs, MSAs, any money paid towards AIDS assistance or Indian Health Services, and any uh, payments that are previously that were previously excluded under uh, the Part D sponsors or um, employer group waiver plans. Um, which that last bullet is a change, um, which I'm not going to go into it much further than that for right now because that ends up taking us down a rabbit hole that we do not need to go down. So this particular slide is directly off of the CMS publications. It is in stereo instructions and legalese, which I, I'm sorry, but I've got to do it. But you need to understand what the difference is between applicable versus non-applicable medications. And basically, the long and the short of it is this. Applicable, medication, applicable medications are those medications that are FDA approved regardless of whether they are brand or generic, okay? And the reason why that is so important is how things are covered when we look at the new standard drug plan that CMS or drug phases that CMS is putting out, okay? The other thing to note is there are changes on the discount program. So before, um, you know, you had a discount program that was part of the cover the the coverage gap, and that's now going away because there is no gap phase, right? And now we are sure we are redefining what the manufacturer discount program is. Um, and it is also referred to as the discount program. And there's key things here that you need to be aware of. This discount that the manufacturers would typically have to pay is up to 10% of the discount on applicable drugs in the initial phase and up to 20% of applicable drugs on the catastrophic phase. Compound medications are not included into this. Even if one of the meds making up the compound is an applicable drug and approved, it still doesn't count because it's a compound. So please note that those are the key changes on the discount program. Now, this is the one that this is why you need to understand that. So where you see the red boxes is for non-applicable meds. Don't look at that. Don't go down that rabbit hole. We are only focusing on the drugs that are covered that are FDA approved. So if you look at this change on this particular grid, you can see how the drugs are going to be paid on the drug plans. Again, standalone or integrated into the MAPD plans. So as you can see, the baseline of this is that you have the deductible at the 590 that the beneficiary is going to be responsible for. And then as they move into the initial phase, you've got up to 25% that they're all that the beneficiary is going to be responsible for when it comes to the initial drug phase. You have 65% of that cost being incurred by the carrier. But look at the key change between the middle column or the first two columns on the right or on the left, and then the one that is on for 2025. See how much blue there is in the catastrophic level? 
the carriers are now responsible for 66 zero percent of the cost after in the catastrophic phase. This and the 65 percent that is in the initial phase is part of what is causing the speculation that the drug premiums for the Part D plans for this upcoming year are going to double, if not be higher than that. So this is where the reasoning comes from as to why that is going to happen. So after the call, um, the webinar this afternoon, several people asked about, okay, but they're supposed to have a cap of 6% each year. This shouldn't be this big of a deal. Oh, but it is. Because that 6% is, the net, is based on the benchmark, national average benchmark for Part D plans, which is roughly about 35 bucks. And that national at the the filing of what they apply towards that benchmark can only be raised six percent all the rest of that the carrier can charge so it's one of those weird loopholes that's have that's happening that is causing this as an issue okay um so yes the carriers can and will do it um be prepared for it but this is part of why I expect Every beneficiary is going to need to have a drug review done to see about if the cost is there um, and they can afford it. To also look at, you know, you have med subs on, you know, if somebody's on a standalone Medicare uh, Part D plan, typically they're tying that with a Medicare supplement. Well, the national average of Medicare supplement increases is 10%. So if that's a 10% increase on your med sup plus the unexpected or expected, depending on how, where they are and tied into these changes, that may now have an entire group of people that is now looking for more cost-effective ways to get their medical treatment and their Part D coverage, right? So it's a discussion that we want to have with those people in addition to anybody that is on an Advantage plan. Now, when it comes to Advantage plans, the Advantage plans and the impact of this change to the, the Part D structure is not nearly as significant because of how those plans are um, subsidized or reimburse, pick a verb that you want to use with that. Um, so it's two totally different ways on how they look at it. So the conjecture that you hear about, oh, well, zero, there's no longer going to be a zero premium med advantage plan. I, that's false. They're going to be there. Um, more often than not, the carrier is going to increase a max out of pocket. They're going to increase hospital stays. They're going to reduce benefits. They're going to change ancillary benefits like dental and grocery and, um, you know, x-rays and things like that before they change a premium. So that whole thing that's out there swirling in the agent community, just shake your head and know that that's false. I think that the zero, the large zero premium plans that are out there on the advantage side should stay where they're at. Now they still, the advantage side still needs to have a drug review. They still need to verify that the formulary, their medications are on the formulary, that they're affordable, and that all of the other changes to the the advantage plans still work for that given client. So you theoretically again have to touch. Every single Medicare beneficiary that is out there is going to need help this AEP. And this is the opportunity that you have available to you. This also is stuff that you want to disseminate out to your referral partners because CMS is not going to do the education outreach on this, like I said, until October. So to be out there, to have the information that and explain to them these this is law it's coming it is coming 
So we don't have to wait for details or changes on it. This is here. What we are waiting for is one thing. The drug payment plan that I'm going to talk about in a second has a second phase of a final rule that has to be determined yet. And that is not expected until end of June or July. And then they have to take it, interpret it, comment it, and then get it out into the community, which is why I do not see the carriers doing outreach to the pharmacists and to any of their partners until late August, early September, and into October. Um, and I think that's way too late to tell people, hey, this is coming and here's some things to be aware of so that you become the educator and the resource that can help, right? So the other thing that I am finding is, is that a lot of people on social media have then asked, because there is this massive change, to the $2,000 out-of-pocket threshold for the Part D, now there's a question about, well, what about all of the people that are currently working that are on Medicare or on retiree medical plans or that are actively working? What happens then? Are they out? Is their coverage credible? Well, what's going to happen if they don't enroll? What has to happen there? So I want to talk a minute about creditable coverage and how that's defined and what's going to happen. So when we talk about creditable coverage, this threshold change is going to affect them somewhat. It's specifically going to affect employers that have more than 20 employees Again, this is going to affect mainly large employee employers that have over 20 people because that's where you have the retiree or the active employee on the group coverage, okay? So on this, the employer must provide a Part D, uh, they must provide prescription drug coverage Two individuals that are Medicare eligible, whether um, that meets the baseline of that standard plan that we were just talking about, right? The group plan has to have, is considered creditable coverage if its actuarial value meets or exceeds the actual value of the standard Part D plan. I just said that, right? So what does this mean and what should what steps should the employee do? What do we need to what conversation do we need to have with the HR people? What has to happen here? So the first thing is is that the employers with the with Medicare eligibles um on their roster if you will, they need to go to their carrier to define whether or not the pro, the plan is creditable coverage going into 2025. So the employer's got to go to the carrier and go, okay, do we have creditable coverage or do we have a problem? If they are on a self-insured plan, then the employer can use simplified determination. Now, here's the thing. In the initial part one of the final rule, it was discussed and thrown out there that they were going to pull the simplified determination eligibility out of a factor. And what ended up happening is too many people came back with the comments and said, whoa, 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 whoa. you can't make a change on the structure plus change the simplified determination. This is going to affect so many people that it's going to be a problem. So what happened is that in the final rule, they changed their mind and they put the simplified determination factor back in. So what the hell does that mean to you? Because some of you who don't work in the group space are probably going, she is totally talking over my head and I don't get it. So now I'm going to explain what, I, what I'm talking about, okay? So as I said, the employer, twenty over 20 lives, 
has health insurance that they offer to active or retirees that has to have that baseline of the Medicare Part D in their benefits, right? That is considered creditable coverage. Now, if the group plan is offering, which the majority of them do, if they are offering what is referred to as an integrated plan, that means that you have the dental and the, the medical mixed in with their drug card. So if the medical and the drugs are mixed into the group plan, that is referred to as an integrated plan. And in order to circumvent the $2,000 uh, out-of-pocket criteria, what ends up happening is, is that they use this eligibility. And that is that the plan design must reach all four of these standards. And that is that it provides coverage for brand and generic drugs. You've got access to retail, retail pharmacies to get the meds. That the plan is designed to pay on average at least 60% of the covered drug, uh, drug expenses. And then the last one for those that have the medical and the drugs mixed in is this that's highlighted in blue. The integrated plan has no more than a $250 deductible per year, has no annual benefit maximum or a maximum annual benef benefit of at least 25 payout of at least $25,000 and no less than a million dollars lifetime combined benefit, which a lot of plans actually cover that, especially the larger group plans. So those are things that you want to keep in mind when we're looking at, okay, is this really a massive problem or not? So when it comes to your member, what happens? So that's this page. So the member notices the employers, I'm going to stop again. The employer must provide a notice of creditable coverage to all Medicare eligible individuals who are covered or apply for the entity, the entity's drug plan. So the employer is the one that has to send that out. And it has to go to anyone that is active working and their dependents, Medicare eligible COBRA people and their dependents, Medicare eligible disabled people and any retirees and their dependents. And that notice must go out once a year before October 15th. Doesn't matter where in the year that it has to come, but it's got to be sent to the beneficiary that is affected that's on the group plan at least once a year. And again, that is a notice of creditable coverage. There are carriers out there that an employer can pay to send that out on their behalf. UHC does this, United Healthcare. Not all carriers do, but this is a service that some carriers offer to the employee, but it is the, or sorry, to the employer, but it is ultimately the employer's responsibility to get that letter out and into their the hands of the member, okay? So that's what you want to make sure that the beneficiary is looking out for or when in doubt, they go to their employer and ask for, do you have a copy of the notice of creditable coverage to verify that my coverage is going to be fine come 2025? Now, why is this so important? Because you only have AEP October 15th to December 7th to make any change when it concerns Part D. Now, if somebody's coming off of group, of course, you have an SCP, but when you are looking at standalone plans and when you are looking at making changes to various MAPD plans going from one to another, these are all, all of these different topics that I've talked about today, you have to now figure out how you are going to 
work this market effectively to be able to help as many people as you possibly can, right? So these are things that you want to go ahead and be very, very careful of when you are, um, you know, planning out what you're going to do for the rest of the summer. Um, you know, I, I do not recommend sitting out by the pool for the next three months and not doing any work. Um, you will be behind the eight ball in a big, big way. Okay. So let's talk about the matter, the Medicare prescription payment plan that I mentioned to before. Um, and this is the last section that we need to talk about today when it comes to these changes. So the law requires all Medicare prescription drug plans, whether they are on a standalone or integrated and advantage plan, to offer um, Part D enrollees the option of um to pay out-of-pocket drugs, drug costs in the form of monthly payments, right? So yes, it is offered to all people, except, um, and again, it is offered to all people, but, and there's a big but there, the benefit and the, mo the people that will be most likely to benefit from this are the people that have at least one prescription that is over $600 to the beneficiary. So if their coinsurance is over $600 per month for one script, then that is going to trigger some, some other activity that we're gonna talk about in a minute to say to that beneficiary, hey, do you know that there's a way that may be more effective for you to pay for your medicines? Okay. What ends up happening is, is that it'll take that one med plus all of their other meds and then divide it into various payments throughout the calendar year from the point that they do the enrollment. Okay. The beneficiary has to opt in. It is not an automatic enrollment. They have to go ahead and um, choose to enroll, but they can say, no, this is not for me and I want out at any point in time. OK, um, they can enroll into this at any point in time as well. So um, what ends up happening, as I said, the beneficiary uh, or participant in the payment plan um, pays zero to the pharmacy. They just go get their meds. The pharmacy can see, yes, they were enrolled in it um, and they're good to go. Um, the pharmacy will be paid on the back end by the carrier or the plan sponsor. Um, the thing that you do want to be aware of is, is that if the person goes to fulfill a prescription and it kicks off that the prescription is going to have an out-of-pocket of $600 or more, then it's going to alert the pharmacy that, hey, this person is eligible for this plan and they are then going to be required to give the beneficiary a Medicare prescription payment plan likely to benefit notice that is a standardized notice that the carriers are going to be required to provide. When the carrier gets the enrollment, the carrier is going to have to process that request to opt into the payment plan within 24 hours. So we've got a lot of moving pieces here and it's, yes, it's going to be a little messy when it first rolls out, guys, um, without a doubt. And some of this may change. As I said, there is a second draft um, of these particulars that is waiting to have a final ruling um, for some of how this is going to be implemented and the timeframes that are, that are involved. But the payment plan's coming. So other things to note, the payment plan is separate than the actual invoice that or premium invoice that they get. So they're going to get two different mailings, one for their Part D plan and one for the payment plan of for their medications. The beneficiary can choose, as I said, to voluntarily cancel their payment plan at any point in time. Now, when they do that... The, if they have an outstanding balance, the carrier that they had the payment plan with can continue to invoice. 
They can send it to collections if they don't pay it. If they need to, but again, the last bullet point, the payment, they have to take those unpaid balances and they have to treat it to with the applicable federal and state laws regarding unpaid debt that's considered medical, right? The other thing is, is, is that the carrier cannot, I repeat, the carrier cannot terminate someone's Part D plan for failure to pay on the premium, on the payment plan, okay? And I know I just said that three times, but I need to drive it home because some of you I know are not listening. The carrier can also terminate the payment plan provided that they have given a two-month grace period or more depending on what is going on, okay? So the carrier can involuntarily terminate the payment plan if they have not paid in the last couple of months. So these are all things that you want to be aware of when you are talking about the payment plan and how this is going to work, okay? So this is the last slide, and I actually did this one pretty quick, which is good. Um, how do you prepare to your communities and your clients? One, um, notify and give your clients a heads up that, you know, they do need to come and schedule time this fall. Um, you do want to get updated drug and uh, provider lists from them. Uh, for those of you that do not know, um, there is a system called Re Retire Flow that is now partnering with um, Connection and any of the Connection based systems. So, Smart Enroll, uh, My Health Plan, um, Medicare Center, any of those Connection based uh, CRMs, or sorry, uh, enrollment tools, they will have the new functionality come uh, the end of July or beginning of mid July. Uh, through Connection for Retire Flow. If you want to learn more about that system, Dalton and I are doing a webinar on June 27th uh, to demo that. You can, again, find the information all over social media. You can also find it on our website on MedicareAnswersNow.com um, regarding that functionality. But you do want to do the outreach to your clients to discuss the upcoming Inflation Reduction Act laws that are changing and being implemented. You can talk about this now if you want, um, although I would probably wait until you get the um, approved presentations and marketing materials. I know of many FMOs that are working on rolling all of this out, um, including myself. Um, there are... Um, tools that you will have available uh, that will be made to you to be able to do it. The other thing that you want to go ahead and note is, again, um, when it comes to making the changes, they will only have from October 15th to December 7th to make those changes, um, and, and that time clock is there. So um, doing events, putting people all in your conference room and saying, hey, let's talk about this. And then planning events during AEP to talk about possible changes is definitely something that you want to go ahead and do. Um, so those are the key changes in the outreach that we have. Um, you know, many of you know, I'm on social media. I am on YouTube, which is how you found this. Um, if you didn't find it, go find my YouTube channel. Um, but please follow me through um, Facebook and on LinkedIn. LinkedIn has more of my more technical um, publications and things like that. Uh, Facebook, you are seeing all the different colors of me. Um, and, you know, and it goes from mental health to professional development to jokes to here's what you need to know and trainings and things that we do. Um, as I mentioned, I do manage a couple of Facebook groups. Uh, Medicare Mo Motivation and Marketing is my um, open to all uh, Facebook group. And then Ms. Medicare takes after the conference. So that one is uh, women only. Um, but by all means, please go ahead and join them. Um, it's a great way to get information real time. Um, and I try to cite my sources as much as possible. Last but not least, again, here's my contact information for you. 
Um, you know, it has been a pleasure today. I hope that you found this informative. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Again, I will be teaching this live on June 20th at 3 p.m. Feel free to register for that or tell any colleagues that you have um, that I am doing this. I'm happy to go ahead and uh, have them attend. Um, and outside of that, I hope that you have a great evening and um, I hope you have a great week, guys. Um, talk with you soon. Thank you.